So the topic that we chose, the power of kindness and compassion. So there's a, a few different ways to look at this subject. One, one area I think where it's good to start is looking at our kind of social conditioning as modern people. There's certain types of anger, I think, that we tend to think is right. And this, this manifests as a qualities of righteous indignation, of self-righteous anger. And uh, so it comes into aspects of what we would consider to be right view. Sometimes we need to challenge our assumptions, especially if, if our assumptions have been very deeply established due to our social conditioning. And we have to have a look, well, what did Lord Buddha teach, actually? And uh, we have to think it through. So we have in civilized society ideas about what is right and what is wrong. What is, uh, I prefer the words skillful and unskillful. What is skillful and what is unskillful? And then if someone, people do things which are skillful, we're happy to praise them. People do things which are unskillful or harmful. Then there's a lot of uh, blame, criticism, and that's normal. But as Buddhist practitioners, we're trying to go beyond what is ordinary. We're trying to realize something extraordinary, which is uh, a purified mind beyond the oppression of greed and hatred. Because of that, because we are Buddhist practitioners who aspire to liberate our minds, purify our minds, then we have to relate to these social conventions a little bit differently. The compassion part is when we have to recognize that when a person acts unskillfully, their mind is affected by delusion. And whether or not they are mindful of it, or, or whether or not you are mindful of it, a mind that is affected by delusion and acting out on that delusion, in that moment is experiencing a lot of pain. And we, we tend to kind of, well, we like to separate a bit like a movie, good guys, bad guys. And we tend to have sympathy for the victim and uh, anger towards the perpetrator of abuse. Now, of course, if you look at it, present moment Dhamma, the abuser, the abuser's mind is affected by painful, oppressive qualities. If you want to look into the future, the abuser was going to swap places with the abused due to the power of karma in the next life or later on in this life, that person will be receiving similar experiences as the one who we can see being abused now. If we look back a little bit, the person who is, appears to be being abused is also experiencing the results of karma. If you really believe in the power of karma, I do, then that person wouldn't, that being wouldn't be experiencing such oppression had they not oppressed. And so when we, when we look at world events and we want to fall into movie type uh, simplicity. We want to have a good guy and a bad guy, someone to cheer for, someone to be angry at, someone to wish success, someone to damn to hell. We really have to stop doing that. We really have to notice when the mind is becoming affected by that kind of duality, that kind of polarization. And we have to remind ourselves of the pervasive nature of the characteristic of suffering and understand that all beings who are not yet enlightened are suffering, it's a matter of degrees, but even those who appear to be abusing, in that moment they are suffering. And when they, when they do unskillful deeds, their suffering is destined to increase. So as meditators, we have to meditate on what is kilesa, what is delusion, and we cultivate loving kindness so that we can have 
goodwill, having impartial goodwill to all classes of beings, the ones that appear to be the victims, the one that appears to be the oppressor, the neutral ones. We strive to have goodwill. We wish well to every class of being, however they may be manifesting. This is very important. <clears throat> this is what helps to protect the mind from, uh, from ourselves making bad karma. So in that regard, it's very powerful as a protector of your mind. For those who cultivate loving kindness, it produces enormous merit. And there is the sutta. I may mention some of these things later on. The 11 benefits that come to those who cultivate loving kindness. But I wanted to look first at another list, the list of the 16 upakilesa. Ilesa are dark qualities that kind of invade minds. And if we aren't mindful, they can take over the mind for a period of time. They become unskillful mind states. It's good to become familiar with the list. Maybe you can, uh, you can do a simple search. 16 upa kilesa. It will come up. The first one, covetousness and unrighteous greed. That's not the one we're going to be looking at so much today. But if you have loving kindness, you will be restrained in how much greed you have. We can see a lot of the problems in the world today stem ultimately from uh, greedy people who have no limits on their greed. So when you have an extremely wealthy 0.001% and a large, massive humanity who are still under the poverty line, we have some very big problems. But the ones I wanted to look at is uh, two, three, four, and five. So number three is anger. Number two is ill will. So it, it probably starts with seeing something you don't like, feeling angry. Once you feel angry, some hostility, that's number four. Then ill will, actually wishing the person harm. Number five, denigration. So cursing them, uh, wishing them to hell, all of these kind of things. So four out of 16 in this area of uh, anger and aversion energy. So the problem with Kilesa and something that we need to be mindful of is that when it infects the mind, it lies. It deludes the mind. This is so so we, we need to, as students of Buddhism, we need to get interested in what is delusion and why is there delusion. The reason there's delusion is ignorance. Because we don't know the mind and body, the nature of the world, according to its true characteristics, we misperceive it. We perceive it in terms of selves and others. And that is conventional truth, but it's not ultimate truth. The more we grasp at the body and the thoughts and the feelings as being a self, the more delusion there will be. The more, and whenever we like something, that can go into the greed, the grasping, the craving. We don't like something, that can go into the aversion, the ill will, the denigration, etc. So this is where the metta and the compassion can help restrain and contain these negative qualities. So as meditators, uh, we, we get interested in this because one of the things you'll notice as someone who meditates frequently is that whenever the mind does become overcome with anger or irritation, self-righteousness, it's not peaceful, it's not happy. And uh, another thing we, we have to kind of investigate is our attachment to our views. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, like, you could, I can, for example, if you're looking at some news and there appears to be unreasonable treatment of a certain group of people, and it's obviously really wrong, and uh, it's, people should be stopping it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sometimes we just have to ask ourselves, no matter how many times you think that, does it change the situation? But just, just being truthful, just asking ourselves. No matter how often I feel upset about what's happening on the other side of the world, 
No matter how often I kind of recite a paragraph or a page or a thesis on the way it should be and the way it shouldn't be and what people should be doing and what people shouldn't be doing, does it change the situation? And when the mind is caught in this habit, is your mind happy? Is there any contentment? Is there any serenity? Is there any wholesomeness? And so this, in terms of being a Buddhist practitioner, we have to be kind of brutally truthful. And we, and we have to be willing to be humbled in our self-righteousness. There may well be time and place for using some skillful assertiveness where one clearly articulates an opinion and writes a letter or whatever, and that might actually be useful. But in terms of like thinking the thought again, should be like this, shouldn't be like that, and getting angry. The prime minister should do this. The government should do that. The United Nations should do this. All of these things should do this and shouldn't do that. Just kind of having a look at how that feels and asking, does it help? And sometimes we can't help ourselves. If something appears to be truly awful, then sometimes we can't restrain it. But this is where the metta practice comes in very helpfully because there's a thing called replacement by opposites. If the mind is attached to one mind state and it won't let it go, that's when we have to become skilled at picking up another mind state. And it seems very simplistic, but it's actually very intelligent. You just sit yourself down and you force yourself to breathe in and say, may I be well. Breathe out, may I be happy. When you recognize that you're not well and you're not happy, the mind is upset. And so sit down, may I be well, may I be happy. And sometimes if, if it's really obvious that there's not much happiness and those words don't make any sense, well, the compassion angle, ask yourself, is there suffering in my mind now? Yes, there's suffering. Okay. May I be free from suffering? That's a wish you can make yourself. Breathing out, may all beings be free from suffering. And we do it diligently, religiously, until the mind state changes. This is actually useful rather than being caught in a in a uh, kind of a negative feedback loop that just feeds itself. And so I think in the modern world, it's important to limit how much news one watches as well. I think that would be an act of kindness towards yourself. Speaking of the power of kindness and the power of compassion, you want just enough news to know what's going on. And trust me, if it's bad enough, you'll know about it. Even if you don't look at any news, other people will tell you. But if you, if you keep seeing images of buildings being bombed and children and women being harmed and people starving, one, it doesn't actually help those people. It doesn't help you either. Arjun Anand was saying recently at his birthday gathering that I attended that a person can be perfectly fine in their own life, have good energy, good health, enough of everything, good opportunities, and they can make themselves utterly wretchedly miserable by paying attention to things happening to other people on the other side of the world. And he just made the point, this isn't skillful. So we need to have a look. When we look at the Eightfold Path, Samasati, you know, what are we, right mindfulness, what are we giving our attention to? What are we being mindful of? What is Samasati? What does Samma mean? Samma means skillful. So, what is it skillful to give attention to? Let me see you come. Let me get some water. It's about 34 degrees here in Thailand today. I drunk my water already. <laughs> so, one moment, slightly dry mouth. So as an act of kindness to yourself, when, when you come and meditate, if you, if you watch just the right amount of news, then you can save yourself sometimes uh, a lot of very painful reactivity, a lot of painful self-righteousness. And uh, 
the mind becomes like what it attends to. So when we listen to the opinions of people on television or internet news, however you get your news, if you're listening to a person who is angry and self-righteous, sharing their opinions of the way things should be and the way things shouldn't be, if you're listening to, to that kind of person frequently, your mind will take on those qualities and attributes. The mind becomes like what it gives attention to. That's another reason why we shouldn't watch too much news. Because the people reading the news are not people with right view, are not people motivated entirely by compassion. Oftentimes the news is present, presented almost like entertainment, you know, the drama of the day with a lot of self-righteous indignation and anger. And so we need to be mindful of that. Expose your mind only to just as much as you need to. As sincere Buddhist practitioners, we have to sit on our meditation pillow and ask myself, ask yourself, ask ourselves, are the people perpetrating violence and being unskillful, are they suffering as well? The answer is yes. Breathing in, may I be free from suffering? Breathing out, may the perpetrators of violence be free from suffering. Are those people who are perpetrating violence going to suffer even more in the future? Yes, they likely are. And try to give rise to compassion for that. Breathing in, may I be free from suffering. Breathing out, may these other people perpetrating violence, may they be free from suffering. Another question, what do you think motivated those people to be violent and, un and awful in their behavior? Were they suffering before they did that? Probably. Breathing in, may I be free from suffering. Breathing out, may those people be free from suffering. And yes, then the current victims. Breathing in, may I be free from suffering. Breathing out, may those people affected by wars be free from suffering. And ultimately, breathing in, may I be free from suffering. Breathing out, may all beings be free from suffering. Breathing in, may I be free from suffering. Breathing out, may all beings be free from suffering. We stop picking winners and losers, goodies and baddies. And we... Just pay attention to the fact that the unenlightened being from the hell beings to the neighbors all still have suffering. And uh, someone who cultivates a loving kindness to be truly powerful and truly vast has a quality of impartial loving kindness. One of the insights that Lord Buddha had under the Bodhi tree in his process of enlightenment when he was reviewing 500, 5,000 50,000 past lives, was he could see that different lives, depending on the karmas that he had made in the past, that he'd been in heaven, he'd been in hell, he'd been an animal, he'd been a ghost, he'd been a demon, Lord, he'd been everything. And it's depending on what uh, karmas he produced and the mindset at the time of death where he'd been reborn, after reviewing his own life, he scanned the, the lives and the past lives of other beings and he could see the same thing. So, so beings currently manifesting as benevolent, lovely beings were in the past hostile, oppressive, unskillful beings. They had to experience the negative consequences of that. They get another chance, they cultivate virtue, they get position of prominence, they may be benevolent. So it's like the whole thing is when we when we take a samsaric view, think about at least a hundred lives back and a hundred lives into the future, then the whole thing suddenly seems rather different. And that's that's uh, when they call, when they call right view, skillful view, because it it lessens the way we grasp, it lessens the way we perceive, and it lessens the reactivity around how things appear to be manifesting now. And this is a gift to yourself, the power of kindness, the power of compassion. The other thing that is humbling is when we recollect that we've done all these things. You know, if you really believe in past lives and karma, I do. We've done all these things. We've murdered, we've raped, we've burned down cities. Did all of that. And... Uh, Fortunately, we've been practicing dana and sila for a good number of lifetimes. We have this current human birth in Buddhist teachings. If you're on a trajectory 
of a lot of positivity. So there's a lot of good that has been done. But we did the bad stuff too. And there's something wonderfully humbling about that. It's like, I can't just sit on my high horse and judge everybody because I'm not free. Another thing Arjun Anand says is, uh, as long as you have the seeds of Kilesa in your mind, there's nothing that you can't do. So we may have our current circumstances where we may have had good teachers, good parents, or we had somehow we learned about civil society and reasonableness and, and we have good standards now. But we don't know if things get very painful, if things get very difficult, if we lose our temper, if somebody hurts us very, very, very badly and we hold a grudge, if we fall into those negative qualities I was talking about, the upakileza, then you what starts as anger becomes ill will, becomes a desire for denigration, domineering. We don't know what we might do to someone if they really, really hurt us because we haven't uprooted the seeds of hatred. So whenever we see these things manifesting in our, outwardly in other places, we also acknowledge that we could do the same thing if we don't purify and liberate our minds. So in this day and age, I think uh, the reason I wanted to take this particular angle on this theme is I think, you know, we're coming into a time, it seems, of uh, more wars, more scarcity, and uh, what has been, uh, what have been very abundant societies, the liberal Western democracies, appear to be becoming uh, less, less comfortable. And this is, of course, you know, karma, the workings of karma manifesting. There may in the future appear to be more reasons to be angry. And this is, uh, we have to prepare for this. You know, so people vote in a government that makes all sorts of promises and then the government gets in and doesn't keep their promises and they do all sorts of things which make situations worse. And, and then people get very upset about this, having governments which aren't representative, having grown up with the idea that governments should be representative. So we have to reflect on these tenets of right view. We're experiencing the results of our karma. And if we, if we see the reasons to be angry and we allow ourselves to be angry and we stew on our angry self-righteous opinions, you could be in a situation where your goodness is degenerating and that, that is not an act of kindness or compassion towards yourself. So we need to cultivate a lot of metta and a lot of understanding of right view so that we, if, if our own situation gets less comfortable, if our government becomes even less representative, if, uh, if things get more expensive, if rent gets more expensive, if food gets more expensive, and, and uh, a lot of the people around you are very angry at the government, what are you going to do to protect your human goodness? What are you going to do to keep your mind bright, wholesome, positive, loving. It doesn't mean that the unskillful things that other people do, it doesn't make them right. Skillful is skillful, unskillful is unskillful. But the things we experience is the result of our karma. And if we react to the results of our negative karmas ripening by making more negative karmas, then our situation will get worse. And so the samsaric perspective is you have to kind of Stretch it back a hundred lives, stretch it forward a hundred lives on your tra trajectory towards liberation. What are you going to do to keep your mind wholesome, to humble self-righteousness? And when you are suffering, this is one of the, one of the wonderful things about the power of loving kindness, is that you can fill your heart and mind with loving kindness, all the love that you need. And it might be the case that your retirement doesn't look like it's going to be as wonderful as you thought it would be, that your career prospects may not be as illustrious as you had hoped, that you're, you might not be able to build a renovation or upgrade to the nicer or get a new car or whatever, whatever plans get frustrated. But you can fill your heart with loving kindness. And you can cultivate loving kindness so that you radiate it to several other beings, many other beings, 
all beings. And if you get skilled at that, when life gets more difficult, when life gets more challenging, there's your challenge. Okay, I'm going to develop loving kindness even further. Okay, I'm going to make sure my impartial loving kindness is truly impartial. I'm going to develop my compassion so that I can have compassion even for these really mean people who are making my life more difficult. And this is powerful. And so in the, in, it's very clear, Lord Buddha says in the Dhammapada, hatred is never overcome by hatred. Only by love is hatred overcome. This is an eternal law. What does that mean, an eternal law? It means it's always true. And this is the thing about the kilesas of anger and ill will. They can delude us into thinking otherwise. But if you come up face to face with an angry, demonic, uh, hostile being, do you think you could conquer them by out-hating them? We really need to ask ourselves that question. <laughs> and then really think about what would the consequences be? There's negative beings inflicting difficulty all around us. Can we hate them out of existence? Can we out-anger them? What's the consequence of that going to be? Well, you're going to be born like them next life. You become a hateful, angry being causing difficulty for others because your own mind became overcome with negativity and anger and you, you allowed your mind to become uh, accustomed to, familiar with anger and aiming it in various directions. So we need to think this through. Be very, very careful. The way we pick up anger, the way we justify it, although there may be reasons to be angry, the reasons not to be angry are superior. And we have to remind ourselves, this is aspects of right view. I believe in karma, I believe in rebirth. Short-term relieving myself of my frustration is not in my long-term benefit. My long-term benefit is patient endurance, loving kindness, commitment to ethics. And this is truly powerful. Like if you don't want to be born in the company of demonic, hostile, evil-minded beings that make billions of dollars selling bombs and whatever, then you keep your ethical standards and you do your loving kindness meditation. Next lifetime, they won't be around. You'll be somewhere with all the nice beings and they'll go where they go. <laughs> so if you really don't want to associate with these people, you just be really diligent in your loving kindness practice and you won't, <laughs> you won't, you won't meet them very often. And, uh, but if you become contentious with them, self-righteous about them, want to argue with them, then you will be meeting more and more of those people. More and more of them will be popping up on your screen. So we have to think these things through. And so, you know, in terms of a daily practice, what when other people, when there seems to be more hostility, more hatred in the world, we have a look at, okay, well, my response to this is I'm going to increase my level of kindness. That's my response. I'm going to take some responsibility for what I can take responsibility for. And then we ask ourselves, what can I do in my day that would just, is a little bit more kind? Is there somebody old next to you, a neighbor that could benefit from, can you mow their lawn? Can you take out their rubbish for them? Can you just ask them how they are? Check on your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Do you talk to them? Do they need some help? Little things like that. Just, uh, dissolving a little bit of the self-absorbed selfishness, looking away from your screen. Take the, take the earplugs out, you know, actually look left, actually look right. Who are my neighbors? Are they okay? Maybe you can rescue a cat or rescue a dog. So take, take care of another being. Make a commitment to doing the metta practice and then dedicate merit so horrible things are happening around the world. You can dedicate merit. And this is, this is one thing that we can't see, but I really believe it's the case. Like Things appear to be quite terrible and getting worse. But one of the things we don't know is what if there weren't beings spreading loving kindness and praying for peace in the world? How much worse might it be if there weren't still arahants and bodhisattvas and people of every religion praying for peace? Well, it would be much worse. And you think of how many nuclear bombs there are in the world and how few of them have actually gone off. 
there's a reason for this. There are virtuous people, there are ethical people, there are people with potent and powerful loving kindness, and they do spread their prayers around the world. And it is a protection. And sometimes we have to bring that to mind as well. There are good beings. There are very devoted people devoted to metta, devoted to prayer, praying for well-being, praying for peace. And that's why it's not worse than it is. It's somewhat confined to certain areas. The potential for war to go global is always there. Why doesn't it? It's because of the virtuous, ethical, good-hearted people who pray and meditate. So we want to join them. The good news is, is that the in the 11 Benefits of Loving Kindness Sutta, uh, the Buddha does describe that for those who cultivate loving kindness, their mind becomes peaceful easily. So many, many people want to experience more samadhi. Many people want uh, peaceful mind states. So here we have very clear instruction from Lord Buddha. If you cultivate loving kindness, your mind becomes peaceful more easily. You also get a radiant complexion. You sleep well. You don't have bad dreams. Devas protect you. And you die with an unconfused mind, among other things. Apparently, uh, poison and fire cannot harm you if you're really diligent. Sharp objects will not penetrate your body. So there's a wonderful protective qualities to loving kindness. And so we, we set our aspiration. I'm a son or daughter of Lord Buddha, disciple of the Buddha. I am aspiring to liberate and purify my mind. I'm committed to being generous and ethical and doing my mental cultivation and, until I can bring that result about. And we understand that loving kindness is actually one of our weapons. This is how we protect ourselves from the defilements and from making bad karma. This is how we protect ourselves. It's a weapon against the kilesa. It lowers our anger. It lowers our self-righteousness. It inclines us towards being more humble. And it reminds us to be sensitive to the suffering of other beings, not just to judge them. So uh, there are many benefits. So I offer that for your encouragement and reflection. I hope something I said may have been helpful to you.